All right, folks. So, um, as I said, there will be an assignment coming, and it's a two week assignment. Uh, so, that will be posted later today. All right. So, um, last time uh, we're talking about um, more general aspects of coherent control of that. And um, so what we were looking at are situations, firstly, where we adiabatically eliminate one of the levels. Okay? And when we looked at that in the case of the two-level atom, we end up with the one-level atom. And that one-level atom's dynamics, uh, in this case, involved an additional phase evolution, which we attribute to a shift in the energy level of the atom, which we call the light shift. And in addition, uh, the ground state now has a finite lifetime because it can be excited to the excited state, which decays. So there is a rate at which population will leave the ground state. I mean, it might come back. We're not including that at the moment. But uh, the rate at which it leaves is um, the scattering rate, the fo what we call the photon scattering rate. And the light shift uh, energy is given by this expression. And if I'm sufficiently far from excited state resonance, it has this form. And we see, importantly, that it, that it scales like 1 over the detuning. Okay. Um, whereas the scattering rate uh, is given by this expression. It's the, the small population of the excited state times the rate at which the excited state decays. And again, when I'm sufficiently far from resonance, the scattering rate scales like one over two squared. So loosely, well not that loose, you can think about these like related to the dispersive and absorptive response. Right? If I have a Lorentzian in the tails, it falls off like one over the detuning squares, whereas the dispersion falls off like one over the detuning, right? So they're intimately related. This is what we talked about there was sort of what happens to the light. This is what happens to the atoms with respect to those different aspects of the dipole response. Okay. And so what that means is that if I'm sufficiently far detuned from resonance, if I have enough intensity, I can have a big light shift, but a small photon scattering rate. Because the scattering rate falls off much more rapidly than the light shift, okay? Um, now, uh, as we discussed last time, the light shift itself, we can understand this is kind of the perturbative, the first order perturbation of the shift in energy due to the interaction. Okay, so if we did first order perturbation theory, this is what we would find. But we, in this case, we, as we said, for the in the degree to which the two level approximation is a good approximation, we can solve the problem exactly in the rotating wave approximation and look for the new eigenvectors, energy eigenvectors, and eigenenergy eigenvalues. Those new energy eigenvectors we call the dress states. And the new energy eigenvalues are here. Okay? And um, I'm plotting that you know, relative to the energy right in the middle here, which is these energy levels as a function of detuning. Okay? This structure is an important one, and whenever we're dealing with, if you want to see 
coherent coupling between two levels, this kind of what we call avoided crossing is a universal signature of the fact that I have some kind of coherent coupling between quantum states. So almost any experiment that tries to demonstrate coherent coupling will show you an avoided crossing. Okay. Um, because what, what is the avoided crossing? Well, what's happening here is we look at it relative to this expression. So let's just forget this identity part because it's the same for both. Let's just look at this part of the Hamiltonian. Um, so if there was no interaction, so remember omega here is the Robbie frequency that's measuring the strength of the coupling to the laser. If there were no interaction, then in the rotating frame, uh, these two levels are just this would be the ground state would have this energy level structure would just be linear like that. And the excited state would look like this. This is just the curve from delta and minus delta, right, as a function of delta. And they cross right when delta is zero. That is to say, the system becomes effectively degenerate. Of course, the energy levels are, but in the rotating frame, they're degenerate. Okay? You have to think about the rotating frame here, always. Um, so the levels cross, we call that, a level crossing. They become degenerate, right on resonance. When you turn on the interaction, the two, they, the crossing is avoided, thank goodness, uh, crossing avoided. Um, and that avoided crossing means that right at that point where delta is zero, now we have this mixing between the two levels, excited and renowned. And now, right at the crossing, the new eigenstates of the system are the symmetric and anti-symmetric. I mean, it could, it could have a phase that would depend on whether this was x, y, or z. But basically, equal superposition of the two levels. They are now the new eigenstates of the system. Okay? Um, off resonance, we have more general expressions. So right on resonance, where theta where delta is zero, theta is pi over two, plus or minus. So that's cosine pi over four and sine pi over four, so that's equal superpositions. Off resonance will have more or less of the, the superposition there, not the superposition of the two. And way, way off resonance, it's dominantly either excited or ground, okay? And the small deviation of what this curve from the asymptote is the light shift. That's the slight change in the energy due to the interaction. And that difference is this. This is the perturbative solution. Okay. So one thing as you, you study in homework is that one way, for example, to take a system from the ground state to the excited state is through by adiabatic passage. I could start the system far detuned from resonance, in which case the ground state is effectively the eigenstate of the system. So say it starts here. I put on the light. I, it's so far from resonance, nothing goes to the excited state. By the way, Will it Rabi oscillate to the excited state if I turn on the laser? Well, as we discussed, you know, if I looked at the probability in the excited state as a function of time, if this is one, then if I look at the Rabi flopping solutions, very little population goes in. However, this was under the assumption that the system starts in the ground state and Boom, I turn on the laser. It's the sudden approximation. All of a sudden, the system finds itself not in an eigenstate of the system, 
and then it evolves in time, right? And it will evolve in time like this. Of course, when you turn on the laser, it's more like, boom, right? It has a, it goes on, you know, you have a switch and it's got some time and the light has to turn on. It takes some time. So the question of whether it's going to just adiabatically go from the ground state to this state or you know have a little bit of Rabi oscillation depends on how fast the laser turns on compared to this gap. Right? Because the if you mine the gap, you stay bad. So if you turn on the light and it's far from resonance, basically you're not gonna Rabi oscillate at all if there's any tail you're far enough. It'll just shift the level. Right? And then as you, if you were to chirp, you change the frequency, and it goes up way above resonance, then the population would, as long as you do that slow compared to the gap, then you will adiabatically transfer to the excited state. And then you turn a light later off, and it will oh, it'll fall back down. <laughs> this is spontaneous okay. All right. Similarly, what about if I wanted to, what about right on resonance? Suppose I start in the ground state, and now I have this laser and it's exactly tuned to resonance. It will generally rob it, right? If, because if I turn the laser on, on a time scale that is fast compared to this now small gap compared to the Rabi frequency, this is like the sudden approximation. The system is sitting right here in, a, within the ground state and it's just going to Rabi oscillate. Okay? The ground state is of course a superposition of the excited states of the system. Each excited, I mean, it's a superposition of the eigenstates of the system. These are the eigenstates. So if I'm in the ground state, I go, I mean, of course, could I make, if I, if I wanted to put the system here, there's a number of ways I could do it. I could do a pi over 2 pulse. Or I can slowly ramp the system and just stop here. Right? And then I'd make that trust state. Or if I do it from the blue side, I'd make that dress fit. Okay. So we're kind of doing it right here, it's not. Um, all right. So the avoided crossing the structure you should familiarize yourselves with is important. Okay, the other thing we're the end we we're talking about. Uh, uh, the last lecture was now looking at this three-level system where we are sufficiently far detuned from this level three. In this case, we're looking at it as an excited level, but we could look at it. We could have done the V-type transitions or the ladder-type transitions as well. And we adiabatically eliminated the excited state, found that the probability amplitude in level three is slaved to the probability amplitude in one and two, and looks like this. And when we plug that back into the equations of motion for the uh, probability amplitudes in levels one and two, that we end up with these couple ODEs, which says the following thing, that this system gets mapped effectively to a two-level system. where there's an effective Rabi oscillation between these two with a Rabi frequency that's determined by this expression, 
depends on the product of the Rabi frequencies associated with these two dipole allowed transitions and the detuning from resonance, okay, under the case where the detuning is being compared to gamma. Otherwise, it's got some delta squares and gamma squares and stuff like that. But this is in that limit, right? Um, and the splitting between these two levels is given by the bare splitting plus the fact that level one and level two are light shifted. Right? So level two is light shifted by some amount having to do with the intensity of laser two and how far from resonance. And level one is uh, light shifted a certain amount depending on its intensity of, of laser one and its of laser one. And there's an effective now difference between those which is the bare splitting and then a little extra splitting generally due to the light shifts, okay? So this problem now maps effectively to a two-level problem. Of course, level one and two, each, each of these have their own finite lifetimes, gamma one and gamma two, due to the fact that you can absorb and then spontaneously decay out of level three. So level one and level two have their own lifetimes, which are related to the scattering rates out of each of those levels, all right? And that's what this decay term is in here. And then in addition, there is an, a, a, an extra term here that is the extra uh, off-diagonal decay, which is given by this geometric mean of the scattered rates, basically, in the two. All right? So what this tells us is that if I want to create an effective two-level coupling between two levels which are not dipole, electric dipole connected, they might be both electronic ground states. So they're very stable levels. They're not going to go anywhere. I can create coherence between them optically through this intermediate level. And this is what's known as a Raman transition. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right, so now there's some many, there are many interesting aspects of these kinds of three level uh, transitions that um, are, it's not just a matter of taking a three level transition and make it a, making it a, uh, A two-level transition, although that's interesting. And so, for example, we could do what we just described before. If I want to, say, take population from, say, and start in this level, and I want to get it to that level, well, there's a number of ways I could do it. I could Rabi oscillate and do a pi pulse, do a Rabi pi, uh, a Raman pi pulse, which it's as long as with the Raman Rabi frequency times the time is equal to pi, then I would transfer population from here to here. Or if things are a little bit, if I can't time things that well, I could do adiabatic passage, right? In the same way that. Um, I did before where I have my Raman detuning say well to the red and then sweep it well to the blue. And as long as I do that slow, 
compared to the Raman Ravi frequency. But fast compared to this photon scattering rates, because of course if I don't do it fast compared to the photon scattering rates, then I don't maintain the coherence that's necessary for me to go through that. That whole adiabatic process is a coherent process, right? The state vector is evolving in Hilbert space and must be to maintain its superposition. Otherwise, it won't be adiabatically evolving. So that's why we call it AD adiabatic rapid passage. It has to be adiabatic compared to the time scale of the Raman, uh, the Ravi frequency, but rapid compared to the scattering rate. And I can achieve that because the, as long as my detuning is sufficiently big from the excited state. Yeah? Um, if we had a tree level system like that, yep. we ADI so we can think of that tree level system as like that. Exactly. System. Okay. Yep. So if we adiabatically take something from 1 to 2, yep. but it was the case that it could not spontaneously decay from 2 to 1, then would it stay at 2? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, it, I mean, it won't go anywhere. So if, if there is, I mean, if these were, say, two magnetic sublevels in the electronic ground state of some atom, then, you know, if I went here, it would just stay there, or and vice versa. So there's no going to be no spontaneous decay at all once I turn the light off. Absolutely. Of course, you know, typically something else will happen. Some other atom will come out of the vacuum and hit it and eventually knock it around. But that might take a minute, and that's a long time on the scale of atoms. Right. Okay, so but so that's all interesting and good and extremely useful, I and mean, it's done all the time. Uh, but there's other things that are also interesting that are unique to the three-level system that don't have any analog whatsoever in just the two-level uh, system, which is kind of like a just a dive more kind of like the Lorentz oscillator in a certain way. <clears throat> so in particular. Um, let's see. We have new features So let's consider the uh, let's look at probability amplitude in level three after a back elimination. Okay. So there it is. I'm just going to write it over here again because I want to look at it on this, this board. So that's minus 
the routing frequency 2 over the routing frequency 1. Right? So that says that if the state were such that we had omega 2 times 1 minus omega 1 times 2 divided by the square root of omega 1 squared for omega 2 squared, that if I created somehow that superposition, so it had a certain amount of population one, certain amount of two, and, and this particular phase relationship, the minus sign between them, then this state is such that um, the population in the excited state is zero. This is what's known as a dark state. A dark state is a state that does not absorb light. It is dark. What's going on? Why is there why why does this dark state exist? what's physically happening. Well, if I look at this, I can say the following. There is, there are electric dipole transitions going from one to three and two to three, right? So there's some interaction Hamiltonian, which is minus d dot d. And there's an E1 and an E2. Each one oscillating at its own frequency. But the dipole matrix element between this state and the excited state depends on the dipole matrix element here times the probability amplitude to be in that state plus the dipole matrix element to go from here to here times the probability amplitude to be in that state. Which means that if this amplitude is equal to minus or it's equal to plus omega 2, and this amplitude is equal to minus omega 1, then those two paths, those two possible histories, destructively interfere. And that is what we call the dark state. It is a quantum interference. It is a coherent effect. It is because these two states are in quantum superposition, which means we can't tell where, which way it went. And so we have to interfere those two paths. And if the probability amplitudes are exactly weighted relative to the strengths of those two transitions, they can cancel. And there is no absorption. And that's called a dark state. For example, if the two, if we chose the intensity relative to the dipole matrix element, uh, so when omega 1 equals omega 2, then the dark state is just the anti-symmetric superposition of the two. Okay. Of course, the symmetric superposition would be bright, right? Because they would, uh, that we call that the bright state. Yeah, Paul, you had a question. Um, yeah, so if we 
put it in that dark state to begin with, would yes. it still Rabi oscillate between one and two where the amount in each changes, or would it just stay in that superposition? Right. So let's remember one thing. Um, in the lab frame, these are the eigenstates of the system, right? And if I'm in one of those eigenstates, well then I don't, nothing happens. If I'm in a superposition of any eigenstates, then generally the state evolves in time, right? So for example, let's go back and think about the following two level case. Here's my two level app. Forget about spontaneous submission. They're just two levels. They're not going anywhere. If I'm in the ground state, I stay in the ground state. If I'm in the excited state, I stay in the excited state. If I'm in any superposition of the two, well, it will evolve, right? But we talk about that evolution as a procession, depending really to that. That is the free procession. And if in our block sphere picture, that was the following. If I'm in any superposition of excited ground, I'm somewhere on the block sphere. Now, of course, that's not an eigenstate, which means the block vector evolves in time. How does it evolve? It processes around the z-axis. But in the rotating frame, it's stationary. So yes, if I start in that through position, it will evolve. I wouldn't call it Rabi oscillating, because Rabi oscillation is about the application of an external force. Right? I just somehow I did my you know, I did my Raman Rabi oscillation. I put it in that superposition, now I turned off the lasers. That state is not an ion state of the system. So it is processing, but that's in the rotating frame, it's stationary. So we have to always remember that there is a, always a clock running. And that clock is related to whatever the energy difference is in the system. And you better have a good clock in your coherent controller if you're going to continue to coherently control it so that you can keep track of how many ticks have happened. Yes. So I'm just follow up on that though. So like if I am in a you know superposition in the lab frame and it's precessing, I can't use this process though if it's in the dark state to try to move its uh, Z component. Or can I? Or I sure. Can't. Well, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do it with those lasers if they had that wrong. Right, right, right. Because okay. yes. it would be dark. Okay. Okay. And it wouldn't go anywhere. Okay. It absolutely doesn't. It would be dark. Okay. Right. Now, there's lots of interesting phenomena associated with these, with these dark states. And one of them is what's known as coherent population trapping.
let's say that I start the system somewhere. Let's say, for example, all the population were in level one. Okay. Now let's consider the situation where this guy decays back only to level one and level two. Okay. So I have those decay rates. So I'm going to absorb, I'm going to emit. I'm going to absorb, and I'm going to emit. I'm going to absorb, and I'm going to emit. Some of the population can end up here. I claim that in steady state, that this is the dark state. That in steady state, it falls into a superposition state, a state which is a coherent superposition of one and two. And once it falls there, what happens? Can't absorb again. That's why we call it population trapping. The population gets trapped in the dark state, and it's called coherent population trapping because it's trapped in that state. Yeah? We can trap it in any... Uh... Any superposition, depending on what we choose for those Robbie frequencies, and that will be chosen by the intensity of those two fields. Let's show how that uh, would work. Let's write down the equations of motion for the coherence in level one and two. Okay? So I'm going to write down an equation of motion for the octagonal matrix element between those two. Okay. So that in our picture here is C two star the way we've written down. And since coherences aren't fed, we can use the effective Hamiltonian picture. Only populations are fed. So we can use our effective Hamiltonian, non rigid Hamiltonian, to get these equations of motion. All right, so then we have to remind ourselves what these equations were. Uh, I guess I, I had them earlier, but put it all together here. This is Let's write it again. So C1 uh, dot was equal to minus I once we A B radically eliminated. So here we're assuming that these are much, much smaller than gamma. They don't have to be, but it just makes my math easier. So I can adiabatically eliminate the excited state. Right? So I'm assuming it in, I could do all three levels, but I'm, I'm too lazy. So I'm just going to assume that I'm not driving it very hard, so that very little population is in the excited state. Then we can adiabatic eliminate, as we did before, and we have these equations.
Okay. So that equation comes from just taking these two equations and putting them together. Okay. So, and this is equal to one, the total population. It's not going anywhere else. Okay. So, um, what happens to this coherence and steady state? Well, let's look at the case again where, I, just for simplicity, where this is right on resonance. Okay, so delta is zero. In that case, uh, the omega Raman is zero. So this term is zero. And let's look at this where I'm right on resonance, little delta is also zero. Of course, the light shifts are all zero as well. I left out these guys, right? The, the, the K, so there's a minus gamma one plus gamma two over two omega two. So this is all zero. This isn't zero. I get the final equation here. The derivative of this is equal to this plus this, and I can look at the steady state. Steady state solution is gamma one two is equal to minus gamma rom divided by gamma one plus gamma two. Okay. All right, so that has that's yeah. Go on. Just, just real quick, so the, yep. the gamma and the gamma two, those are just the, the scattering rate related to the the uh, the rate at which I'm going after I'm leaving that state. Okay. Of course, it comes back in, but it still decays the coherence. Here's my steady state solution. This says that in steady state, the coherence is not zero. In steady state, there is coherence between level one and two. And what is that coherence? Well, we can plug in what that was. This would be to minus the square root of S1, S2, divided by S1 plus S2, right? Because remember, gamma, gamma 1 was S1 over 2 times little gamma. This was S2. And this is just equal to. Related to the square root of omega 1, omega 2, over omega 1 squared plus omega 2 squared. Uh, squared. Or minus omega 1, omega 2, over omega 1 squared plus omega 2 squared. That is exactly what we expect. The coherence associated with the dark state is the octagonal matrix element of the density operator, right? And that is equal to C1 times C2 star, which is exactly that. So what this says is that the system will spontaneously for S, and it will do that until, by chance, it falls into the dark state. And once it falls into the dark state, it's trapped. It will stay there forever. This is, was used as one method of laser cooling back in the 1990s, where things were specially tuned so that the Doppler shift associated with the atoms was that the dark state 
was the state that wasn't moving. So if the atoms happened to fall into the dark state, they would be cold. Now, kind of hard, it's kind of an, it's not a very efficient process, but it's a process that can get the atoms that happen to fall into those states extremely, extremely cold. And it was a process that was called velocity selective coherent population trapping, or as the French like to call it, VSCPT. Because they, they may like saying VSCPT. <laughs> They were taught to come into New and tell you all about DSCP. Yes, Z. So the the decay rate from three to one and the decay rate from three to two are the same, or roughly the same? Um, we didn't really even care about that. It came in here nowhere into the, into this problem. It, it's irrelevant. There was nowhere that I said there was uh, a. Um, I said that there's a total decay rate gamma. Okay which is equal to gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Okay. But okay. what gamma 1 and gamma 2 okay. are, we're not relevant to the dynamics at all. And so that, that total gamma, the gamma 1 plus gamma 2, that's in the... That's, the total, rate of, rate? that's uh -huh. the total rate of decay of this. Uh -huh. The scattering rate, uh -huh. gamma 1, is equal to S1 over 2 times gamma. Okay, okay, I thought it was and, gamma and, 1. And, and so, Okay. Gamma 1, I mean, there is a big gamma 1 and a big gamma 2, which are the rate of refeeding okay. into levels 1 and 2. But those rates play no role in the dynamics of the coherence. Yes. Of the coherence. Yes. Yeah. But so, I mean, they will play a role if I want to know how at the population, but, the, but not in terms of the coherence. All right, so that's one pretty neat aspect. We're going to come back to this in a moment about three-level systems. There's another really neat thing we can think about relative to uh, this kind of dark state, which is the following. So we have our general expression of the dark state, which of course I just erased. So I'll write it again. Well, let's suppose that, uh, omega 2 was 0. Okay. What's the dark state? Just be in the, the second, second. Exactly. So in that case, it's, you know, any moron can see that 2 is the dark state. Right? Because there's no light. Sorry, if you didn't think that. But, uh, because two is dark, right? It's not absorbing any light. All right? And similarly, if um, one is zero, then everyone knows that one is the dark state. states of the interaction with eigenvalue zero, right? So in this three-level system, there is a basis of three levels. One, two, and three. 
There's a basis. But there's another basis, which is bright and dark and three. Right? So those are eigenstates of the system. Let's think about that for a moment before we come back to this. Let's just let's do it things a little bit more general based on what we were talking about earlier. Let's say we have this V2, just to make it a little bit more interesting. There's level one, level two, omega one, and omega two. Okay. Now, when what we just did at the beginning of the lecture is for the two-level atom, we looked at the dress states, right? The dress states were the eigenstates of the system, including the interaction with the light. <coughs> what are the dress states here? Well, I claim the dress states are the following. Obviously, there's the dark state. That's a dress state because it's an, an, a state whose eigenvalue is zero. So that's one of the dress states. Of course, then there's some superposition of bright and three. So the bright state couples to level three as an effective two-level system. And those two levels get mixed together by the mixing angle, just like the two-level system that we had before, where the bright state, and if I'm sufficiently far off resonance, then you know, essentially we have bright, three, and dark. But of course, bright and three can be mixed together if I'm, right? Yes, sir? Should that be sine, minus sine theta over two? Yeah, yeah, over two. I know, there's too many threes floating around. Absolutely, theta over three would be really weird. Okay, very good. So one of the lessons here is that the dark state is an eigenstate of the interaction, the total Hamiltonian, including interaction. Well, these certainly are. Now, here's something not every moron can see. Certainly, I couldn't see it in the other one. Who knows? Um, can I adiabatically, how would I adiabatically transfer from 2 to 1? By just changing the intensities, not the frequencies, of laser one and two. Well, let's say I start in level one. Okay? I turn on this light. Doesn't do anything. But if slowly I turned on the intensity of this light, while I turned off the intensity of this light, then at the end of the day, all the light is here, and all the population is up there. Huh? I want to get the population from here to here. What I do is I first turn on that, on that light, and then I turn on that light. And quantum mechanically, through the magic of superposition and coherent evolution, the state will evolve from here to here. Intermediately, right in the middle, where I have equal super amounts of light in the two, I will be in an equal superposition, right? If omega 1 equals omega 2, I will be in a 50 50 superposition, but with a minus sign in between them. 
And then as I turn this light off and this light on, more of the population will end up here and less of it will be in here. That is really neat. That's called stirring. which is stimulated Raman adiabatic passage. And it's become a ubiquitous technique. It was in only noticed and invented, I think, in 1990 when I was a graduate student. Uh, not really wasn't that long. Um, uh, and it's what's also known as the counterintuitive pulse sequence. I'm not giving that up. Because intuitively, if I want to get population from here to here, well, I want to go like that. So it seems like I want to turn that on and then turn. Right? And I could do something like that, right? I could stimulate think up here and then try to drive it down there. I could do that. Of course, if I tried to do that in steady state, it wouldn't work very well, right? Because I can't really drive, I can only saturate half of the population up here. I could rob, I could rob oscillate from on a pi, I could do a rom on pi pulse. That would work. But I have to know the intensities very well. And I also have to know what the detuning is very well. The thing that is beautiful about adiabatic passage is that it doesn't matter exactly how I evolve it. As long as it's adiabatic, it's going to work. So for example, I can imagine the following kind of experiment. I have a beam of atoms, or whatever, molecules. And I have two beams of light. One beam of light that's uh, associated with omega-2, and it has you know, some intensity profile. And then I have another beam of light that is sort of overlapping with it. Right? And as the atoms fly through here, first they see omega-2, which means they see this. So they're all starting out in this state. And as they fly through, in the middle they have equal amounts of the two. And then they'll see less and less of omega-2 more and more of omega-1, and eventually they'll all end up in level 2. And that's used all the time these days in nuclei and all kinds of, it's a way of transferring very efficiently populations. The way that Debbie Jin and, and Dunye made cold molecules, you might have heard about, they had the two laser cooled atoms that they associated, that they were in very high vibrational state. They wanted to get them down to the a, a, a cold molecule. It was done through the steer app because it's a very efficient method to do it. Yeah? Maybe because this is kind of intuitive, I don't understand it, but you're saying that in your picture it starts out at one? That's right. And then it hits the omega-2 Exactly. Okay, so that's the counterintuitive thing. That's exactly the counterintuitive thing. Exactly. Exactly the counterintuitive thing. Right? Because it's hitting that. Like, what's that doing? It's not doing anything. Well, of course it isn't until eventually there's a little bit of the one. It's the fact that it's creeping up in one and creeping down in two where the, all, the act, all of the action happens in here. Right? It's where they start to overlap. That's where the coherence is being transferred in this region. Very good. All right, but wait, there's still more. Um, let's think about the following scenario now. How would you know which one was the 
dark stage, but was wondering too to know which laser to put first. Well, it depends if you know what. So you have to know the structure of the system in which you're trying to transfer. So in this thing that I just described to you, for example, I might have a molecule that has different vibrational levels. So it, here's level one, which is a high vibrational state. So I've taken two atoms, they're cold, and now I've associated them, but they're not tightly bound. So they're floppy molecule. They're not really, you barely would call it a molecule at all. I want to get it all the way down here to ground vibrational state. It's very tightly bound. So I prepared it here. I know it's there, but I want to get it down there. So what I do is through adiabatic passage, first there's some excited state up here. Put on this as my omega-2, and then put on my omega-1, and I will put it here, <laughs> counterintuitively. Right? Through the magic of quantum evolution. But if if they, they're kind of floppy and barely associated, yep. what's that higher state? Is that where they're just not associated? Yeah, well, in that state, they might just be completely dissociated, but you don't actually ever have any population here, right? It's a dark state. Never any population in there. Yeah, I know. But wait, it gets better. Maybe the same. I don't know. Okay. Let's consider the following scenario. Another important, very important new feature in my new level before all. So let's say I have level one, and I we know that if there's some excited state, we call it three here. And if I were to scan the absorption and dispersion over this, I'd have my usual two level. If, assuming this is weak, this is a probe. I'll say call this omega probe. As long as the intensity is sufficiently low compared to the saturation intensity, then we know that the system responds like a Lorentz oscillator, right? And if I were to look at the absorption of this as a function of the detuning, uh, I would see a Lorentzian, right? And if I looked at the dispersion, I would find uh, you know, the usual kind of dispersive line shape for the level system. Now, suppose I do the following. I take these two level, a level, there's a level, another level around two, which is dipole connected. And I dress the level three with level two with a strong coupling laser. So this is a strong field. I don't think about this perturbatively at all. On, on this, okay? So level three is no longer just level three. It's now a dress level that involves the superposition of these. There are two dress states. There's one, if I'm right on resonance, then we know that the dress states are what for this state? Yeah, with equal amplitudes. They're the symmetric and anti-symmetric. One is 2 plus 3 and one is 2 minus 3, right? So I can think about this system equivalently the following. There's level 1, and then there is the two dress states, right? The two dress states are split. They're split. If this is right on resonance, what's the splitting between the grass states? Is there not any? Or what's that? Is there not any? If they're run on no, there is. Oh. Because remember, that if 
there's not any, if you don't have the interaction, but then you put the interactions and the, and the degeneracy breaks, right? And the two levels split. So would the spleen just be H bar times the coupling? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just this. In fruit units, it's that. They're split by that. Now, I'm, if I'm right on bare resonance, I'm right in the middle between the two. Right between the two dress states. What do you think the absorption rate is there? So this is now split by that amount. And I have this probe, this weak probe. The answer is zero. It doesn't absorb at all. It is, if you were to dress this with this strong coupling laser and then put on the probe and look at it, it would be completely transmitting. It would be transparent to that light. That transparency is induced electromagnetically. Hence the name electromagnetically induced transparency. Or, as its effect we know, EIT. So EIT is a quantum interference effect it's closely related to the dark state. As we'll see in a moment, remember the dark state was the or two paths that destructively interfered, right? We started with some superposition of these and the two ways that we could get to this state destructively interfered, which meant there was no absorption. EIT is closely related, but it's not exactly the same thing because these are very, very unequal intensity. So the two paths are little, not quite as clear. It's much cleaner, and you'll do this in your to think about this as there are two paths to absorption. One's above resonance and one's below resonance. And those two paths coherently, destructively interfere such that no absorption happens, okay? Um, so let's, there's, you're gonna look at this problem in your homework, coming homework assignment in uh, a couple of different ways. One of the ways that we can look at it is just to solve for the dipole response. So we can think about this as there's a, in the same way that we had the two-level system, and we looked at the induced dipole moment, and we saw what was the polarizability of that induced dipole as a function of detuning, we can do that here. We want to know what is the dipole response, which is related to this coherence. How much coherence do I generate as a function of the detuning of this level for a strong coupling. Okay. So that's done in the notes. For, I don't want to go through, you know, the algebra is boring. Uh, but I can just sketch it out for you for a moment, just so get to the, the main points. So if I do the right out the master equation for this, again we could do the we could always, always write out the evolution of the coherences just using the non-Hermitian effect of Hamiltonian because there's no feeding of coherences by uh, the spontaneous terms. It's only in this in our problems. I mean, there can be, but the problems we're talking about, these are distinguishable events, so we don't feed the coherences. So this is equal to the following. 
I delta minus gamma over two three one minus I the probe rate population difference between one and three. And then we have this coupling term which depends on the coherence between one and two. So this is the new piece. If I just had the two level atom where these more of my two levels, then this would be the usual master equation that it would involve how the coherences were driven by the population difference. Something like the U and V components coupled to the W component of the block vector. I have this additional term now because it's this three level atom, which wasn't there before. Um, row 2, 1 evolved as such. So these are the Mass, this is the master equation. This is the equation of motion for the, these different coherences. Now we want to look at this in the case where, where our coupling laser is very, very strong compared to the probe. Okay? So that's, the, that's the case, that's why this is called the coupling laser. This is a weak probe, so that there's only linear response with respect to the probe but nonlinear response with respect to the coupling laser. So in some sense, this is a kind of nonlinear optics. Um, so because this is so much bigger than this, we can just ignore this term. Okay? Under that approximation, the coupling term is big. Moreover, we're looking at linear response here so that little population is ever driven into the excited state. So this will take to be zero, and this approximately one. When we put all that together, we get the following <coughs> approximate expression. That the off-diagonal coherence between level three and level one, proportional to the probe Robby frequency, we have delta plus I gamma over two minus the coupling laser Robbie frequency squared over twice the detuning. Okay. And this is equal to minus D, the dipole matrix element 3, 1, times uh, over H bar delta plus I gamma over 2 minus the coupling squared over 2 delta times the probe frequency, right? This was the minus D31 E probe over H bar. Okay, let's look at this expression. If we had no coupling laser, if this were zero, this would be the familiar complex Lorentzian, right? So this is my polarizability. And it would be just that. It would have the, this exact form with real and imaginary parts that look like that. But I have this new term there, this new term that depends on the coupling laser. When you plot that, it looks as follows. As a function of the detuning, the imaginary part looks like this. Well, it's single value, but. So this is the imaginary part of alpha. It has this 
PIT dip. There's a window, this is, I don't know if you can see what the heck I drew. It's supposed to go to zero. Right? So right there, it's zero. The absorption is zero. And the width of this dip depends on the strength of the coupling relative to gamma. Right on resonance, where previously I would have had the most absorption, I get none at all. And that's due to the interference between the two possible paths, because this is no longer one state. There's, a, there's this dressing here, the splitting, these two dress states, and they interfere with one another. What about the real part of polarizability? Well, it looks really weird. So whereas before it looked like this, now, oh gosh, I'm going to just try this. It has this very sharp feature right at zero. And that very sharp feature that you'll see it in the notes means that right there, the index of refraction is an extremely, extremely strong function of frequency. With that changes rapidly over this dip area. And because the index refraction changes with frequency very much, it means that the group velocity, which is very different from, uh, which is not going to be necessarily anywhere close to the phase velocity. In fact, the group velocity here can be close to zero. And this leads to the phenomenon that you may have heard about of slow light. So back in 1999, there was an experiment done in Harvard by Nina Howell, who slowed a pulse of light to move famously at the speed of a bicycle, about um, 17 miles an hour. Um, and it was, of course, it had to be extremely narrow band pulse, because it's only within this narrow band that you have that. But uh, this fact that we have this extremely nonlinear dispersion relation means I can get extremely slow light in that regime. And it's one of the ways in which people are currently looking at manipulating the light by slowing it down. Because if you could slow it down, you can make it interact more with stuff. And you might even get to stop and just then just sit there in the medium as a memory and then release it when you need it. And it's all about quantum coherence that allows us to do that. All right. Um, oh, I guess I should say one last thing. One last thing, just for one minute. What is the, what are the two paths that are interfering? So suppose I start here. What I say, and I look at it in the bare base. In the dress bases, it's easy to see. Once you do your homework, you'll see. But what about in the bare bases? Well, I could, one path to get here is to go directly there. That's path one. How else can I get there if I'm not there? Well, I could go up, stimulate it down, absorb back up. That's the second path. And those two paths destructively interfere. 
So it is a dark state interference again, but it's but it, a slightly different one that we had. Coherence propagation. Very good. All right. I will be posting.